this morning, turn to Joshua chapter 2. It says, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Chittim, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So when they came to the house of the harlot, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there, it was told to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up on the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your truth. We thank you for the truth through the, the song that was just sang. Lord, as we begin to dive into your word this morning, I just pray that you, you be with us. Lord, untie my tongue so that your words may come out. For it's all these things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So, if you had your Bible open uh, a little bit ago to uh, Joshua chapter 2, go ahead and open that up again because we are going to go through all 24 verses. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's, there's probably one in front of you. You can get it on your phone, whatever, uh, whatever means you have. But it's going to be important because we are going to read through the, the whole chapter at, at some point. A few weeks ago, we went through Joshua chapter one. Uh, you didn't have to be here. This is not part two of the, the sermon, but um, our main focus today is that God wants you to live a promised life just as he called Joshua to live in the promised land. And so uh, can you imagine what it would be like if every person followed Jesus, that followed Jesus Christ, lived consumed with the purpose and the promise of God. The impossible would be possible. The unthinkable would be thinkable all of a sudden. I mean, we, we have people that are going to church. We have people that are claiming to be Christians. But are we going out, do we really believe what God has said in his word? I don't know if we do. We're going to examine that a little bit today. Um, and so do we wholeheartedly believe it? It's like if, if the weatherman tells you it's going to rain and you said, oh, it's going to rain and you leave without an umbrella and you just say, well, he said it was going to rain. Well, I didn't think it was really going to happen. Do we really believe what he says or are we surprised when he comes through for us? So, so we're going to look at this. I think that we have a lot of people who, who maybe aren't doing that in, in our society. As a coach, I, I, I coached a lot of folks, and I've got some guys here that coach with me. I coached some people who what we would call are 40-40 players. We would only put them in if we were 40 up or 40 down in a game. <laughs> they didn't really quite grasp it. Maybe when they were young, they, they were that 40-40 player, but by coaching, pouring into them, and more importantly, listen to this, them believing what the coaches said. If they believed what the coaches said and they did, and, and they trained, training, reading the word, if they trained, then by their senior year, maybe their junior year, they could help us out. But it was only because if they believed in what the coaches said and did what the coaches said. And so uh, the Bible teaches that God can use people on his team that we would never think about using. I mean, we look at them and, and our society, 
But let's be honest. We put people on different levels. And we hang out with the people on our level. And we say, oh, God can't use them because I go to church every week. You're going to learn today that God can use everyone and that we need to open our eyes to that. And so the first point that I want to make this morning is that God can use you in spite of your past. God can use you in spite of your past. I just read verses 1 through 7 from Joshua chapter 2. Notice Rahab's situation that she's in here. Of all the people God could have chosen to assist in his mission, he chooses a harlot. He chooses a prostitute in Rahab. Have you noticed, though, throughout the Bible, he uses the underdogs to sort of shame the wise, right? He had David that slew Goliath. What about Gideon? He was the youngest in his family, from the weakest family, from the weakest tribe, and God used him in a mighty way. What about the disciples? God took those 12 Ragtag, that ragtag group, bunch of fishermen and just guys from everyday life. But when he put them together and he poured into them, they were powerful. Even Jesus himself hung on the cross. And when he was hanging on the cross, he looked weak. But through his death, burial, and resurrection, he was strong. It was powerful. And so let's take a minute to look at her past. This lady named Rahab, she lived a sinful life, probably full of guilt, shame, fear, probably asking herself, why did I choose this, this way of life? Saying things like, nobody loves me. Nobody in my family, nobody in the community loves me. There's probably somebody in this audience right now that may be thinking that same thing. Maybe you've been pushed away by your family. Maybe you've been pushed away by friends. You think nobody loves you. Jesus does. She also lived in a sinful city. We're talking about Jericho. God's judgment was getting ready to come down on Jericho very soon. And that's where she lived. And the only hope for a sinful person in a sinful city is to repent to a holy God. That's the only hope. It's the only hope we have. Ronald Reagan, when he was president, he said this. Here's a quote. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be one nation gone under. I think we're on our way. Rahab was known in Jericho as a sinful woman. Everybody knew she was a sinful woman for many years. I'm sure some people would have said she's been a sinner for too long. I know that woman. She doesn't deserve to go to heaven. She's lived a sinful life. I know what she's done in her past. She doesn't deserve mercy. However, God was able to use her in spite of her past. A few years back, we used to go on this mission trip to West Virginia. Um, it was a family trip that we would go on every year, every summer. It was near, I think it was Hillsboro, West Virginia. One of the missions that we had, we would do various things, but one of the things that we would do, we could go out to one of the men's prisons and Pastor Steve would bring a message and he would say to a few of us, hey, I'd like you guys at the end of the message to stand up front here because there's going to be some guys come forward. So I volunteered as one of those counselors. Now, I had never helped in prison ministry before. I didn't know what I was to expect. These guys didn't look like me. They led a different life than I did but I was willing to serve, so, so I go forward. Pastor Steve brings a great message, and so I'm standing there, and in my mind, I think if I stand on the end, maybe they'll go to the guys in the middle first, but there's a flood of guys that come forward, and here I am standing, this guy comes right to me, and I think, great, I have a softball because 
One of the guys that's leading the praise band, his name was Don. And Don comes forward to me. And he says, I'd like you to pray for me. He's going to ask that I pray that he gets out. Nope. He said, listen, I got to tell you that I've been in here for several years. I'm supposed to be in here for life. But he said, I want you to pray for my mother and for my, and my brother. He said, you see, since I came here, I came to know Christ. I have that peace of mind when I lay my head down on the pillow, but my mother and my brother don't have that. Could you pray for them right now? I said, absolutely, Don. So I prayed for him. Well, later, that trip, as a matter of fact, it was the next day, we would have another program. That's where we would go in and we would listen, and it was really geared toward teens. We would listen to five of those inmates come in and they would share their story on what they had done. I found out that Don was a murderer. He had, he had killed a man when he was 19 years old. It wasn't an accident. He stabbed him 30 times. It wasn't an accident. But he found Christ in prison. He started the worship team that we, that we listened to. He started that team. They practiced every day. Another thing, they started a Bible study in their block. And they would have a Bible study daily. Christ used him in a special way where he was. Think about this also. Two years after that, every year we would go back, I would seek out Don because he, would, he was right there leading the, the praise team and I would talk to him. I would pray with him. The third year that we went, he said, I've got some good news. I'm thinking he's going to get paroled. He said, my mother and brother were saved. Amen. From in that prison, in those visits, he was able to minister to them and soften their heart and through the Holy Spirit's working, this man, in spite of his condition, was able to minister and share the love of God with his family. Think about the woman at the well in John chapter 4. When she encountered Christ, she was living with a man that wasn't her husband, and she had five other husbands. That's a woman that was shunned from her community. As a matter of fact, the reason she was at the well right then is because she wasn't supposed to go with the rest of the women. She wasn't accepted by her community. Still yet, Jesus was able to use her. So God uses her in spite of, Rahab, in spite of her past. Now, notice the secret that she has, in, in, and it's in verses two through seven. Some people make a big deal about this. I, I don't see it as a big deal. But she said a lie to protect the spies. And sometimes people get hung up on it. They shame her for lying, and they say, well, God would have found a way to protect those men even if she didn't lie. Well, I'm sure that maybe that's true, but think back in, in Exodus that how God used the Egyptian midwives to let the male babies live. You know, because Pharaoh had ordered those babies to die. But in Exodus chapter 1, verse 20, it says, So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. And so the midwives lived to lied to Pharaoh because they feared God. They feared God, and he provided and took care of them. Rahab had two choices that day. Number one, she could have turned those men over to the king of Jericho because she didn't have fear of God. She could have turned them over. But she protected God's men to honor the king of heaven. Uh, you and I have to make that same choice daily. Are we going to choose to please man? Or are we going to choose to please God? God's word doesn't applaud her. Let me point this out. God's word does not applaud her lying. 
but he does approve of her faith. And it's talked about several times. God uses imperfect people by his grace. Hebrews 11.31 says, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. James 2.25 says, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? To live a life that God promised, you must choose to put God's will above your own. Now, had those men from Jericho been found up on a roof, they would have been killed along with Rahab and probably everyone in her family. But she was willing to trust God. And we must be determined to serve the Lord no matter what the consequences are. And there would have been some consequences for her in choosing that. Now, let's also notice her statement. Now, if you have your Bibles open, we're going to jump down to verse 8. We're going to go through 8 through 11. It says, Now, before they lay down, she had come up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that terror the terror of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you went, before you, when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, and were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed, When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remain in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is a God of heaven above and on earth beneath. I love her statement there. It's a statement of faith because she's so focused on who God is and what he's done. You see, they've they've heard the stories of of what has has happened before to people that stood up against them. And they weren't excited about what was on its way. And she knew that. She knew that it was a God of authority. She knew that he was a God of power. And she knew that he was a God of salvation. That's who was coming. And Rahab knew that if she didn't believe in God, that same thing was going to fall on her and her family as well as everyone else, all of his judgment. Rahab had what most people in America don't have. It's a healthy fear of God. This, this week, I, I heard an author speak. And some of you will, will know this man, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but this author gave an interesting talk. It was about a televangelist from the 80s. His name was Jim Baker. And some of you may giggle because of, uh, you're thinking, Jim and Tammy Faye. You remember Tammy Faye's hair, right? But they built this, I don't know what you would call it, a dynasty, 125 million um, empire in the mid-80s of televangelism. And um, he resigned in 1987 in the midst of a sex scandal. His wife ended up divorcing him in 92, but in 1990, he was arrested on fraudulent charges with money, and and it it was just a mess. It was really a a bad mark on televangelists. And so this author wrote a book about how he had fallen from grace in in so many words. Once the book was written, four, four months after that, he called the author and said, would you please come and see me? And so the guy goes to see him, and and the first question that this author has is, tell me something, when did you fall out of love with God? And he says, the author says, he took me by the shoulders, and he says, I never fell out of love with God. Through all of this, through everything that happened, through the trial through, through my sin, through the divorce, through everything, for, through my time in prison, I've never fallen out in love with God. My problem is that I didn't 
fear God. I always loved Jesus, but I didn't fear God. You know, I, I think that we have a lot of people like that in our country. Romans 3.18 says, there's a fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. God still has a message for us today, but it's not that he's out to get us. I, I think people hear about the, the fear of God, but they don't really have it. They don't see the end. They see a merciful Jesus come into this earth. Yes, that's true. But there's also judgment that they don't see. And that's what Jim Baker was saying. He always loved Jesus, but he didn't fear God. God still has a message for the world today, and it's not that I'm going to get, get you if you mess up. It's that the message is the gospel that tells how God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever calls on him, whoever believes in him, is not going to perish, but is going to have eternal life. It's a message that Jesus saves sinners. It's not just for those that go to church. He saves sinners. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's a message that the Lord died on the cross and he rose three days later to live everlasting. That's a good news that comes out of that. But we need to trust him. If you go to our nation's capital and, and look at some of the monuments or look at some of the buildings, they have the word God inscribed on them somewhere. There was a time when our nation feared God. There was a time when we were a Christian country. That time has sort of gone away. In fact, it's a time, I think, for a spiritual revolution. And, and that can transform the culture in our country. And you can say, it's not going to happen. We're too far gone. It's not too far gone. It started with 12 men when Jesus left and went back into heaven. It started with that group of disciples. It can start with a group smaller than this. It can start with this group. But we need to ask God for an opportunity to share Christ with someone this week. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. When's the last time you've shared Christ with someone? We need to do that. Forget about thinking about it being perfect. As I shared with someone else earlier this week, I don't care what verses you can quote. Tell them what life was like before you knew Jesus. Tell them how you came to know Jesus. Tell them how your life has changed since you met Jesus and how you're going forward since then. That's it. Share it with them. Then you can get into reading with them, but you don't have to have it down perfect. And it doesn't have to be a dramatic story. Some of us were raised in the church, and so you don't have that dramatic conversion. We're not going to all have that road to Damascus uh, thing where, where Paul was, was faced with Jesus and he was blind, and, and then he, the scales were removed from his eyes. We're not going to have that. It might be but it doesn't have to be. Just tell them how, how it works in your, in your life. So he can use you in spite of your past. Our second thing that we have, God can use you to bring hope to your family. Think about that. Just like Don did from inside the prison walls, he brought hope to his family. Here we are in Joshua. We're going to read verses 12 and 13. It says, now therefore... Please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give him, give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So as soon as Rahab knows that God's going to take care of her safely, she wants the rest of her family to be taken care of. I hope you feel the same way. If you've got that good news, you need to share it. She wanted to make sure now that she's going to be safe, can I have the rest of my family in here? 
One sign that you're saved is that you want to share that with other people. You bring the hope of your your family by telling them how Jesus is working in your life. Once again, you don't have to beat them over the head with the Bible, but by the way you're living, they're going to see a difference. Fathers, if you're getting up every day and you're reading the Word, or you're reading the Word before you go to bed, You think your wife's going to notice that? You think your children are going to notice that? They will for two reasons. Number one, physically, they're going to see you reading it. And number two, they're going to see the change in your heart. Because if you get into this word, it will change your heart. Be ready for that. I love it when I see adult men and women baptized. Up here, you know, um, when I, when I was speaking at Union Church, in one day, we baptized a nine-year-old and a 90-year-old. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It wasn't too late. It's not too late for anyone. But when the men get baptized, and if they have children, and you see them standing up watching their father, they're like, that's what I want. That's, that's who I want to get behind. And that's, that's who we all need to get behind. Earlier this week, I guess it was on Monday, Stacy and I got to go up to Baltimore and we got to hear some testimonies from, from some amazing people. One of the guys is a wrestler from the University of Maryland. And the chaplain that's up there, he, he's actually an FCA guy and he works with a lot of the teams up there. Well, what he was doing was bringing up one of the wrestlers with him. And this father of the wrestler said, I'm sending him to the University of Maryland. We're not going to go to Iowa. We're not going to Penn State, which those of you that don't know, they're they're traditionally great wrestling schools. We're coming to the University of Maryland. My goal is for him to be a national champion. That's my greatest desire, is to see him be a national champion. At the end of the year, he won the national champion. But he was one of the eight young men that was baptized during the year. The father called back and he said, or he said to the chaplain, would you walk with, with my son on his senior year, would you walk with him out as he's announced? For those of you that don't know, that's usually reserved for family. But he said, I, when he came to Maryland, I wanted him to be a national champion but he's, he's got something far greater. He's got a victory far greater. That's, that's a good story. There's a man that you can get behind. And to, to let you know, you know that that's happening just up at the University of Maryland, it's not just with the, uh, with the wrestling team. We saw some of the football players up there also that shared their testimony. And so, so that's amazing when we see people sharing that And because of this young man being baptized, his family is affected. So your family's greatest need is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray for their safety. You can pray for their success. You can pray for anything. But if they don't have salvation, if they don't have the Lord in their heart, all that other stuff, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money they make in their lifetime. Doesn't matter what kind of house they live in or what kind of car. If you haven't led them to Jesus Christ, have we really been successful? Rahab was saying, God, you've saved me. Now use me to save my family in you. That's what she was saying. Your witness for Jesus Christ may change someone's life forever. I've got a lot of stories today. There's another girl that that was up at that same banquet. Some of you may know her. Her name's McKenna Cox. She was recognized with something called the O.J. Brigance Award. It's just courage under adversity. McKenna will tell you and her family will tell you they didn't really have time for church before she was in an accident. And people that live in Calvert County may, may remember this story. McKenna was hit by a car while she was sitting on the side waiting for her brother and sister to get off of the the bus. She wasn't just hit by a car, she was dragged under that car, and when they got to her, she was lodged, 
under the car, stuck there. Nine surgeries. She was placed in a medically induced coma, but after nine surgeries, she came out. People started saying to her, you know, McKenna, a lot of people have been praying for you around here. So she started after six months in the hospital and all these surgeries, she started going to church with her friend, Ryan. As a result of this, not just McKenna, but her whole family. She's got three siblings, mom and dad. They all started going to church as a result of that. That's saving your, that's the same thing that Rahab did. I, I want to save my family too. More than that, her school family. We get down on public school sometimes, but let me tell you, and she shared this on Monday through video, that 80 kids on a daily basis, let me say that again, 80 kids on a daily basis meet at Calvert, High, Calvert Middle School for prayer. And she leads it. When, when she wanted to share her testimony at Fields of Faith, she goes, Mr. Chris, I don't know any Bible verses or anything. I said, McKenna, I don't care. Tell them what happened to you and how God is working through your life. People, people applauded her several times in, in her story. To live out a life for Christ means that you allow God to use you, to save your family, to save your friends, to save your community. In this particular story, Rahab was supposed to only tell her family. We'll find out before, before these spies leave, they say, okay, only tell your family. They're the only ones allowed in here. But in our story, we're supposed to tell everyone. And so, and I'll tell you, if you ever meet McKenna, she'll tell anybody who's gonna stand still long enough. Um, <laughs> She'll probably even tell you if you're walking slow enough. You know, she, she'll tell you about it. But God used Rahab to bring hope to her family, and he can use you to bring hope to your family, to your friends, and to your community. And number three, he can use you to impact eternity. And now let's look back at our scripture. This is a long section, but I think it's important to, to read right from God's word. We're going to read verses 15 through 22. It says, then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. So she said to them, go to the hill country so that the pursuers will not happen upon you and hide yourselves there for three days until pursuers return. Then afterward, you may go on your way. The men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless when we come to the land that you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you have let us down and gather to yourself into the house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your, household, and all your father's household. It shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from this oath which you have made us swear. She said, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And they departed to the hill country and remained there for three days until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road, but had not found them. Never underestimate the faith, what faith in the living God can do. It was Rahab's faith in her, not her faith in herself, but her faith in God that made all the difference here. She didn't have faith in herself. She had faith in God. Uh, knowing the city of Jericho was going to be demolished very soon, she decided to place her faith in God. And that's important. God says in verse 18, he says, 
bind, they, the, the men say, bind this scarlet cord to the window. Why, why, what does that mean to us today? That scarlet cord ha- does have a meaning. It represents the blood of Christ. We hear about that when, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, right? They put blood over the door so that, so that the death angel would pass by. Here, she ties the scarlet cord, which represents Christ's blood, in the window so that the, the people coming in to destroy the land will pass her by and everybody inside will be safe. In the same way, the blood of Christ delivers us today from the wrath of God, just as that scarlet cord saved her and her family. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You see, in the old covenant, they used to bring stuff to the altar and they would have to slaughter it. Praise the Lord, we don't have to do that anymore. Christ died once, once for all. And so that's important. If you and I are going to be people who possess the life that God has for us, There has to be trust in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. There just has to be. There's no other way. And so we we need to note right here also, as we're closing up, the, the confidence of these men. Now, these men have been protected. You you can imagine, we just sort of pass it by saying, oh yeah, they came in, they hid, and then they left. This was probably a pretty scary situation for them, but they trusted in Christ that he would get them through. In verses 23 and 24, it says, Then the two men returned, and they came down from the hill country, and they crossed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they related to him all that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, surely the Lord has given all the lands into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. That's quite, that's confidence that they have. Before they go in, they just say, listen, they're just going to roll over for us. You know, God has given us this land. I, I know that we're promised this, but let me tell you, I've been in there. These people were scared to death. We've got this. And so, so verses 23 and 24 tell us that, that there's no ma- uh, doubt in their mind what the Lord would do. The story of Rahab shows us that God can use anyone's life that believes and trusts in him. God includes people in his family that we normally wouldn't even think about. Eventually, Rahab is going to marry. Now, now here's, a, here's a cool part about the whole story, and many of you know this. Eventually, Rahab would marry a believer. You know, she was a Canaanite. Also, remember, God told the Israelites not to mix with the Canaanites. You know, don't mix with, mix with the other side of the track there, so to speak. But here, a Canaanite is saved through her faith. She marries a believer, Well, wouldn't you know that they have a son and his name is Boaz. Now, Boaz is the grandfather of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. Now, David's the one that slew the giant, King David. And so what is greater than being in the line of King David, right? Well, there is something greater. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, we find that Rahab is in the genealogy of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You think you have some people in your family? (laughs) Right? (laughs) Jesus, in his line, look at it in Matthew uh, 1, 5 later. There her name is, and she's described as a harlot. She's described as a prostitute. Down the line, here's King David. Down the line, here's Jesus Christ. That's amazing. God can can use us. And so God uses Rahab to show us that he can bring anyone into his family. Anyone can be on his team. And, And today is a day for you to declare that I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting 
What, what Pastor Brad has told me here is true. I can read it in your word that you can use anybody. You can choose today. Hey, use me. One of the things I liked about our praise and worship this morning, did you notice our youth that are up here with them? Youth that are sitting here, I don't care how old you are, you can be used by God. I think that, that Timothy might have been 13, he was a teenager, a mid-teenager, 13 years old, when Paul started pouring into him. Timothy, you can be used, young people. McKenna is being used, eighth grader. She's an eighth grader. She's impacting her family. She's impacting her community. She's impacting her state because people that saw her story have been contacting me all week. And so today you have a decision to make. Are you going to live a life full of fear? And here's what I mean by fear. Maybe you have something in your past that you're worried about. I don't want them to find out about this. God could never use me. That's the world talking to you. Are you going to believe the world or are you going to believe the word? Believe what the word has to say. If you believe the world, you, you're going to live in fear the rest of your life. And you're not going to have what we call the promised life. You see, Jesus has something he wants to share with you. He wants to have a promised life for you. Just like the Israelites had the promised land to go into. Whenever those spies came back to him the first time, they were scared. They said, we can't take this land. And so they decided, or God decided, well, then just wander in the desert for 40 years until this generation's gone, and then I'll get the next group, and they'll go over and take it. Do you want to live in fear the rest of your life and say, God can't use me, God can't use me? You'll go to the grave never living the promised life that he's called you to. Or you can step up and say, God, how do you want to use me? Do you want to use me in my family? Do you want to use me in my community? Do you want to use me in the church? How's it going to go? God can use you wherever you are and wherever you've been. I don't care what it is. We see that this morning. And so church, this morning, as our, as our praise team comes forward, I want to tell you, that this altar is open. Maybe you've been used in the past and you've stepped away from that. Maybe you want to get fired up again and, and rededicate it. You can do that at your right at the pew. You can do that here. Maybe you've never chosen the life to, to come forward and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can do that today also. One of our deacons, Joe's coming up right now. He'll be here with you. I'll be here to pray with you. We'll have other deacons around. If you want to make a decision to follow Christ and believe the truth that he has to say and live a promised life, you can come forward today. Jesus died on the cross for all of us. Like I said before, society likes to put us in different rows. This person's sin is greater than mine. This person's job is better than mine. They're, they're, they live in a different tax bracket, whatever. They're not as good as me. I'm not as good as them. The world's going to lie to you all day. Right here, we just heard that Jesus can use you no matter where you are and what you've been through. And so maybe you want to come forward and accept that promised life that Jesus has for you. Maybe you want to join this church. If you would like to join this church, right now it's, it's as simple as this. You, you can come forward. We've got some, uh, some paperwork for you to fill out. We have some, some classes that, that we can go through about what's the next step. We have connect group classes that can help you to grow after you've made that decision. But the first step in joining this church is just coming forward today. Let us know you want to be a part of it. If you've never been baptized, we can get you up here and get you baptized in the next few weeks. Maybe you're coming from another church and you just want to transfer membership. We can do that too. So 
What I really want to tell you is don't leave here if you have a question in your heart about where you stand and how God can use you. Because if you, as you heard today, He can use you in spite of your past and He can use you to help grow your family, bring your family into the, to the family of God. And so uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your truth. I pray now that as we go from here, Lord, as we go into this last song, that if it's on someone's heart, that they, that they need to come forward and accept you, Lord, that you just give them the courage to step out. Lord, if it's you that they're seeking, they've come to the right place. We can help them through. Lord, give us the wisdom. Give us the discernment to, to help them. Give us the words as they come forward, Lord. And, and we just thank you for your truth. We thank you for, for the message that you laid on my heart to share, Lord. And, and I just pray now that, that as we go into this last song, if there's anybody who has a doubt in their mind, if they want to accept you, that they come forward now. If they want to join the church, Lord, they can come forward right now. But we just turn this time over to you, Lord, as we close out this service. In Jesus' name, amen.